Why is it that, after almost six decades, humans still haven't gone back to the moon? Does that mean today's rocket technology is actually worse than what we had in the past? Of course not. The truth is, we can go back any time. But what's the point of simply repeating history? Right now, we're aiming for something much bigger. As Elon Musk said, a permanently crewed lunar science base would be far more impressive than a repeat of what was already done incredibly well by Apollo in 1969. That's right. We need to build a base on the moon. So, what long-term benefits would a real lunar base bring us? And when will we actually make it happen? Let's find out on today's episode of Alpha Tech. Time is like a river that never flows backward. It keeps pushing us forward, and if you can't keep up, you'll get swept away. In science, technology, or any industry, if your tools or your products don't evolve, they eventually become outdated. And in the aerospace world, SpaceX is the one setting the pace. They've built Dragon, the most advanced spacecraft transporting astronauts to the ISS. They created Falcon 9, the world's first partially reusable orbital rocket. And now, Starship is on its way to becoming the first fully reusable rocket ever made. That constant cycle of upgrading and reinventing is exactly what puts SpaceX where it is today. And at the center of all this is Elon Musk, someone who thinks far beyond the limits most of us are used to. Recently, he posted a message essentially saying, if we already made it to the moon back in the Apollo era, why should we just repeat the past? Why not aim for something greater, like building an entire base up there? It might sound crazy and unbelievably difficult, but that's exactly the kind of challenge we need if we want today's spacecraft to truly break new ground and reach those bigger goals. And Musk isn't just talking, he's actually building the Starship Human Landing System, or HLS for short. This is a lunar lander with an insane level of innovation. To get a clearer picture, just compare it to the vehicle that once took humans to the moon, the Apollo Lunar Module. It was about 7 meters tall, weighed just 15 tons, carried exactly two astronauts, and touched down on the moon for only a few hours before lifting off again. It ran on hypergolic propellants, wasn't reusable, and each one was left behind in lunar orbit or on the surface after every mission. Meanwhile, the HLS Starship stands around 50 meters tall, with a landing mass between 100 and 150 tons. It's designed for four astronauts, but its internal volume is enormous. Theoretically, it could accommodate up to 100 people. It can carry multiple rovers, tens of tons of cargo, and a huge amount of scientific equipment. Simply put, Starship's interior volume is about 200 times larger than the Apollo Command Module. On top of that, HLS features an elevator for crew and cargo, a massive pressurized cabin, and life support systems that allow astronauts to live and work on the moon for up to a month. Because the leap in capability is so huge and they're building it from scratch, it naturally takes time. Even with delays, it's worth it, far beyond any other lander. Take Blue Moon Mark I, a small testbed, not designed to carry the massive loads needed for construction or long-term habitation and its old-school design will quickly become outdated. Starship, on the other hand, is built for heavy lifting. Its cargo capacity is a game-changer. With that kind of lift, we're not just sending habitats, we can also bring pilot-scale factory equipment to test extracting water, oxygen, and even metals straight from the lunar surface. If Starship performs as planned, it could be the true turning point for in-situ resource utilization on the moon, a bold, entirely new mission profile. Right now, NASA is criticizing SpaceX for being slow with HLS, simply because they're in a hurry to beat China in the race back to the moon. But didn't we already do that 57 years ago? That's right. So why don't we just follow Musk's plan, like he said himself? Uh, anyway, we should have a moon base, Alpha, which is the next step after the Apollo program would be to have a base on the moon. So now we have Starship HLS, and there's the moon base Alpha plan. We pretty much know what the vehicle will be like, but what about the actual plan? The idea is that, someday in the future, once SpaceX has mastered orbital refueling and Starship can land safely on the moon, perhaps as early as 2028, they'll start working on a base at the moon's south pole. The terrain is rough and uneven, but the region has plenty of ice deposits. Imagine this. After the HLS Starship touches down vertically on the lunar surface, the crew climbs out using an elevator along with support tools, robots like Optimus, exploration rovers, and tons of equipment. 
Right next to the landing site, they begin assembling greenhouse-like habitats, similar to snow igloos in the Arctic, but on the moon. A few compact modules, a crew of astronauts living and working there for long durations, and all the systems needed to keep them safe and supported. Initially, the crew will stay inside HLS itself, since it covers all their immediate needs. Oxygen, food, water, exercise. Gradually, they'll start building the external base. Once the infrastructure is stable, subsequent crews can arrive one by one. But here's the big question. How do we stay in contact with spacecraft on the way to the moon or with people working on the surface? And once you're there, how do you get electricity? If you wanted to charge your phone, how would that even work? There are no outlets buried in the lunar soil. We're talking about building something like ports on Earth, places where landing ships can dock, unload cargo, and launch again safely and reliably. One major challenge is landing. Rocket exhaust kicks up a huge cloud of dust, and lunar dust is sharp. Once it's thrown into the air, it clings to and scratches everything around. Without an atmosphere to slow it down, it shoots out like shrapnel, capable of damaging nearby structures. Because of this, any HLS ships arriving later need to land at least 70 meters away from the base construction site, or they need some kind of protective measure, like special tarps that shield the infrastructure, keeping dust out while also blocking cosmic radiation. This is a big challenge because designing a moon base has to start by asking, what would daily life on the moon actually look like? But are we just going there to learn how to survive? Would that even be useful? Absolutely. The moon is just a stepping stone for Musk's bigger goal, sending one million people to Mars to live there. And since the moon's environment is far harsher than Mars, if we can survive on the moon, living on Mars will be much easier. The immediate plan is to create an Earth-like environment on the moon. First, food. Initially, crews will eat packaged meals sent from Earth. Meanwhile, they will grow plants in greenhouses, crops NASA has studied for survival in space, like watercress, lettuce, tomatoes, and potatoes. But what about meat? They can't exactly bring cows or chickens to make fried chicken or steaks. Instead, astronauts will rely on 3D bioprinting to produce lab-grown meat, a technology already being developed by several agencies. Next, oxygen. One astronaut needs about 0.8 to 1 kilogram of oxygen per day to breathe. For a four-person colony, that totals roughly 5 to 10 kilograms per day. Luckily, the moon soil contains plenty of oxygen. The best approach is in situ resource utilization, extracting resources directly from lunar regolith, specifically carbothermal reduction, heating regolith with carbon from coal or methane, at 1,500 to 1,700 degrees Celsius in a reactor to release oxygen. NASA has already demonstrated this using lunar soil brought back by Apollo missions. The drawback? It consumes a huge amount of energy. That's why a nuclear power plant on the moon will be essential. At the same time, this method could also produce liquid oxygen fuel for HLS, which is crucial for future Mars missions. After all, the return trip from Mars is incredibly long, so developing this capability on the moon is a critical step. The rest is simpler. Daily life, eating, living, holding meetings will still mostly take place inside HLS. Oh, and one thing I didn't mention, HLS itself can actually be used as part of the base. So you don't need to build too much from scratch, which saves a ton of resources. We can also use cargo starships to expand the base. The initial idea is that they'd land horizontally so they can immediately become part of the habitat, while HLS ships carrying crew would still land vertically, so they can take off again straight from the lunar surface. Plus, all these vehicles come with large solar panels and are integrated with Starlink technology, so electricity for everyday life is already covered. This is essential for communicating with Earth or recycling water. Speaking of water, astronauts will actually need to recycle all their urine through filtration systems. It sounds gross, but after purification, it's completely clean and drinkable. Of course, this is all about resource efficiency, because water on the moon is mostly trapped in ice deposits. Mining it isn't easy, the temperatures are extremely low, there's no direct sunlight, and the ice is buried 1 to 2 meters underground. The safest approach is to rely on robots and solar power to extract it. Even though we've never built anything on the moon before, we're not starting from zero. We've already learned a lot from large-scale construction projects here on Earth. 
Techniques like geographic information systems allow us to analyze terrain and divide land into usable zones. That approach works just as well on the moon. A fully developed moon base could include areas for landing, cargo handling, maintenance, scientific labs, mining, power systems, habitats, even greenhouses and recreation spaces. These zones need to be organized to keep everything running smoothly, safely, and efficiently. And yes, redundancy is key. Having more than one landing pad, for example, keeps operations going if one pad fails or is in use. The infrastructure goes even deeper. Think about roads between zones, trenches for power and data cables, fuel pipelines, radiation shielding, blast walls, the list goes on. Once a site plan is solid, engineers can start identifying all the systems the base will need and break them down into specific design requirements. Sure, there are still major challenges to building a permanent moon base, but there are plenty of reasons why now, or in the next few years, is actually a perfect time to do it. HLS has experienced delays, but that's mostly from NASA's perspective. For humanity, this is an incredibly exciting breakthrough vehicle, even if it's delayed until 2030, or even if China lands on the moon first. It doesn't really matter. We've already done it before. Right now is all about preparing for an even greater mission, and only SpaceX, as the pioneering company, can build Moonbase Alpha. If you support this vision, drop a Go SpaceX in the comments. Every bit of support helps the engineers working day and night to shorten the path to this goal. And don't forget to subscribe if you found this video interesting and exciting. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Two, one, ignition, engines full power, and liftoff. Go Falcon, go Transporter 15.